Okay. PowerPoint to record, not for the crutch. Okay, let's talk about uh, bacterial genetic regulation. So the first thing is why even regulate? Why regulate genes? What do you guys think? You don't need some until you're in a certain situation. Right, right. we talked about versatility, <clears throat> excuse me, versatility last time. If you have this big genetic repertoire, some of those genes are going to be evolved for very, very specific situations. And if you have those always on, you're perpetually wasting energy. And the fundamental rule of all living things is you want to preserve all the energy you have. You don't want to waste energy. Okay, the other thing is um, when we talked about eukaryotes, right, there's all kinds of levels of complexity and eukaryotes compile themselves into multicellular organisms. All multicellular organisms are eukaryotes. There are no multicellulars that are bacteria. Okay. So when you have a multicellular organism, we talked about how sometimes like if you have neuron cells or if you have muscle cells, those are going to be completely different structures, completely different genetic programming. Well, same genetic programming, but different regulation of that blueprint, that DNA blueprint. So you have to control for that. If you don't control, you get things like cancer, so cancer is often a result of improper regulation, things turning on when they should not be on or things turning off when they should not be off. Okay, so regulation is super important. And understanding regulation is how we build stuff. You need to understand the circuitry to make things work in the way that you want them to work. Okay, the other reason is, and we'll study this in detail when we look at the operons, um, the bacterial operons is, a lot of these genes um, for, we look at specific ones in metabolism, you don't wanna be making genes that metabolize, say, a milk sugar, like lactose, when you're not in the presence of that chemical, right? Like, you wouldn't make something to digest a chemical that you don't have. So, again, regulation is often linked to the nutrients that the organism is absorbing. So they adapt, this is again a fundamental, back to the first lecture, a fundamental property of living things is they adapt to their environment, they can sense, and they change the way that they behave. Okay, so let's start by talking about how regulation happens in bacteria. So let's talk about transcription regulation. Okay, so there's sigma factors. So I talked about how your polymerase, your RNA, polymerase. So that's your enzyme that does the central dogma from DNA to RNA. Okay. And the RNA polymerase pops on at the promoter and starts transcribing messenger RNA five prime, three prime. Right. I also told you that RNA polymerase is a complex. Okay. So there's, there's a bunch of enzymes here that stick together to form this complex. Okay, and oftentimes this polymerase can be modified by a particular subunit, okay, called the sigma factor. And the sigma factor's job is to make the polymerase bind specific promoters. Okay, so imagine yourself, imagine you are a virus and you want, you have your own virus polymerase, virus polymerase. Do you want, as a virus, this is selfish gene theory, put yourself in the genes of the virus, put your mind in the genes of the virus. Um, do you want yourself as a virus, do you want your polymerase transcribing any other genes except your own? No. no. So you want to control that process. So viral polymerases often have their own sigma factor that will only recognize their own ORFs. So you don't want your polymerase transcribing RNA from the genome of your host, maybe in particular cases where you want to manipulate something, but most of the time you just want to replicate yourself. So you want your messenger RNAs made, not the hosts, okay? So they will make sigma factors that make the RNA polase, polymerase very specific. So that's just kind of what that is. You'll see all kinds of sigma factors which will regulate promoter specificity of the RNA polymerase, okay? Then there are small RNAs, S RNAs, okay? What are those? They're small. Right, they're small. 
So these are RNAs that don't code, they don't code for a messenger RNA per se, say, but they are, they're not non-coding DNA because they code for something. They code for important information. Okay. So they're not non-coding and they're not messenger RNAs. They're just tiny RNAs and they have different roles. They can, um, for instance, you can make antisense, antisense, small RNA. So imagine you have a messenger RNA template, five prime to three prime. Okay. And imagine you transcribe an antisense messenger RNA that matches that. So this would be the green thing would be your small RNA. And this would come from maybe a different ORF. Or maybe you're reading it from the other side. So if this is a promoter here, maybe you're just transcribing a little bit of thing from this side of the of the ORF. Okay. Now what can happen is this now is double-stranded RNA. Can the ribosome translate double-stranded RNA? No. no. So now all of a sudden this thing is not getting translated. So you shut off that gene by just transcribing a little tiny, what's called quote-unquote antisense, antisense RNA. Okay? So that's one example of a small RNA. Riboswitch, riboswitch. So what's a riboswitch? Um, messenger RNA molecules, five prime, three prime, do not always look like this. Or single stranded, single stranded RNA. They don't always look like a little linear line like this, right? Messenger RNAs have open, exposed. A's, U's, G's, and C's, which all are looking to form hydrogen bonds, right? So you will not see a messenger RNA molecule that looks like this. You will see things that look like this, okay? Where they loop, they form hairpins, they try to stabilize themselves, okay? And oftentimes, these loops, these hairpins, these structures, structures will form regions, let's say region X, that can bind to chemicals. Chemicals. These could be secondary metabolites. They could be a little sugar or something like that, or they can maybe an amino acid, okay? They can bind chemicals or molecules. And oftentimes, if you have molecule X in region X, that will cause a downstream effect on translation. Maybe it shuts it off, or maybe it turns it on, or maybe it regulates it by titer. Okay? So that's what would be called a riboswitch. Epigenetics. What's epigenetics? Yes. What's kind of like the broader theme of epigenetics? Is that the one where uh, genes aren't turned on until like certain growth stages like in your mind? That's a case of, I think that would be a case of epigenetics. So epigenetics in general is kind of like modifications on the DNA. Yeah, but not like mutations. Right. Not mutations, not changes in the sequence modifications on the DNA. So one example of this, correct me, was that you can methylate, methylate DNA, okay? And that can change the structure of the ORF in a way that is no longer receptive to an RNA polymerase, or maybe it makes it more receptive to an RNA polymerase, okay? So you can have modifications that change the structure of the DNA, not the sequence, that can turn things on or off. Okay, you can also write, we talked about in prokes, they don't have typical wrapping proteins, but in eukes, we talked about histones, we talked about SMC proteins. All these things get modifications, protein modifications. Okay, so histones can be methylated. We talked about this in the first lecture. Histones can be methylated, they can be ubiquitolated, they can be sumolated. 
sumoylated. They can be phosphorylated. And all these things change the ultrastructure, the tertiary structure, the folding of that particular protein. Or if it's a nucleosome, changes the quaternary structure. Okay, And that change in the structure can induce changes on the chromatin. Okay, so imagine normally, we talked about this, normally your chromos chromosomes are wrapped as nucleosomes, the beads on a string, and that beads on a string are wrapped into the 30 nanometer fiber. And then that 30 nanometer fiber is even wrapped even more during, during mitosis or meiosis, things like that. Okay, if the chromatin is wrapped tight, do you think those genes can be accessed? No. No, they're off. This is what's called, quote unquote, heterochromatin. Did I put that in here as a thing? I don't think I put that. It was in last week? Okay. So heterochromatin. That's like really tightly wrapped DNA. Um, what's the opposite now? Euchromatin. Thank you. I've, I was thinking it was that, but I was like, that's too simple. Euchromatin. So that's when the DNA is like open, okay? And when it's open, your transcription factors combined, your RNA polymerase can come in and bind, things can be on, okay? So the classic example of this is the heat shock promoter, HSP, HSP, I'll say HSP70A. I'll give you a real specific one. So this is heat shock protein 70A. And the name of the gene is HSP70A. And HSP, so this is the ORF, HSP70A has a promoter. And in that promoter, if you heat shock, heat shock, that means you raise up the temperature, then this region of chromatin on the promoter converts to euchromatin and it turns on the HSP70A transcription, which gets translated, central dogma, into the protein. And then the protein's function, HSP, P70A is actually to refold proteins that break. So it refolds broken proteins that are broken by heat. Okay. So it's an actual, here's a logic circuit where you heat things up that causes things to break. The cell has an immediate response to repair those things by opening up this region, this promoter region in the presence of heat. And then it turns on the gene, the gene gets translated and then fixes the problems. That's a classical logic circuit um, that is related to epigenetics and also related to transcription factors. A kind of, and you, there's classical pictures. If you look at uh, Indrosophila, you'll see real, real tight uh, heterochromatin. And then when you heat shock, you actually like it like actually looks like this. Like you can actually like see the region open up like this classical microscopy pictures that look like that. And they say, look, that's where the HSP 70 proteins are. That's where the heat shock proteins are. Okay. Let's see. Transcription factors. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> transcription factors. E. coli itself has 314 transcription factors. What is the role of a transcription factor? It's more uh, transcription. How? Be more specific. That's correct. But we want to start thinking on the level of molecular interactions. What happens? What has to happen for transcription to start? Unwind the DNA. Well, let's assume the DNA is already unwound, because if the DNA was not unwound, the transcription factor would not even have access to its site. So let's assume DNA is already unwound. Okay, what, what makes this? What makes this? Does it yeah, it, that's that's the perfect way to say it. So the transcription factor recruits the RNA 
polymerase. That means there's actual like physical interactions between the transcription factor and the RNA polymerase directly, or maybe intermediates, or maybe an ultrastructure of DNA. But the role is fundamentally to recruit the RNA polymerase. So if you imagine the cell, it's all kinds of RNA polymerases floating around, like ready to transcribe. And if there's a transcription factor and it gets bound and activated at its site, it will literally recruit the RNA polymerase to come and make messenger RNA. Okay, so that's actually what you what transcription factors will do, TFs. Or they could be opposite. They might they might in theory block the RNA polymerase. So we'll talk about that. So it's not one or the other, um, but a good way to think about on transcription factors is that they will recruit the RNA polymerase, and the off ones would block. So are they little molecules that bind to the RNA? Correct. Well, they bind to the DNA. So this is a step before transcription. They're, they're transcription factors which regulate transcription. So they're binding. That's a. Uh, it is correct. They will bind to the DNA. So what mean? What do you think they? What kinds of their structures would they look like in their amino acid content? Positives. Yes, they'd have positives, right? This is they'd have lysines and arginines, or they would bind metals like zinc that are positive to interact with the negative phosphate backbone. Okay, so those are transcription factors. Uh, okay, so there's a fundamental difference in structure of genes of prokes and eukes. Why is that? Space. Yes, exactly, space. We talked about this. Prokes have reduced or streamlined genomes. Eukes are more versatile in the sense that they allow for specificity. Prokes are much more streamlined, okay? So their genetic structure of organization just literally has less room. So they look different, okay? So let's talk about how they look. So let's talk about operons. Have you guys heard that term before? Heard it before. Do you, would you be confident in saying what the what it is, what it does, okay. So there's four pieces that define operons. Remember these. Uh, syntony. What's syntony? I'm not thinking of something else, but is it when like you can have one coding region and then part of it also is like another coding region for a different topic? I'm not sure what you're saying, but I think that it's incorrect. Syntony is um, the order, the order of genes. So let's say you have gene A, gene B, gene C, gene D. If you looked, so let's say this is an E. coli, and you look in uh, Wolbachia, and there are orthologs for A, B, C, and D, A, B, C, and D, and they are in the same order. That means the syntony is conserved amongst these two species of bacteria. If you saw gene X there, the syntony is not conserved. Does that make sense? That's the first thing is syntony. So operons are functional units of genes that the, the order of the genes matters. The syntony is conserved. Okay. Operons in operons, the syntony is conserved. Co-regulation. What's co-regulation? What do you guys think? Multiple things regulate when it turns on and off. Yes. So Let's do three gene operon, A, B, C. There's literally not enough space to regulate all these independently. And why would you? Because most of the time, I'll just jump right in. Most of the time, point four, these things have a shared function. They have a particular pathway in which the syntony is organized to address. So there's no need to regulate them separately. So oftentimes there will be one promoter one promoter and one terminator 
that controls all three. All three. Okay? That's co-regulation. They're regulated in the same way. Okay? The four, third point, polycystronic transcription. What's that? We know what transcription is. So polycystronic transcription is when the Paul, RNA Paul, pops on at the promoter and it synthesizes one messenger RNA, one transcript that encodes three proteins. Do you see? So you've kind of been taught in biology central dogma, which is gene translated to RNA to protein. That's all true, but sometimes you can have multiple proteins coded in the same transcript, okay? That's polycystronic transcription. It means it's poly, there's multiple uh, cystronic transcription, uh, transcriptons, whatever you call them, okay? So in this transcript, I guess here's a good, I, I haven't got to it, it's been on a couple of lectures, um, but I, this is a good time to talk about it now. The shine, Delgarno and uh, I'll save the others for later. Let's talk about Shine Delgarno. So Shine Delgarno is a sequence sequence that's encoded in the DNA and the RNA that will recruit a ribosome. So you need, in theory, you need to put in between these genes, Shine Delgarnos. Otherwise, the ribosome is going to start right here every time. Ribosomes are not perfect. The rib if the ribosome starts at the, at the beginning of the transcript, it will read through and sometimes it will fall off. Okay, so sometimes that means if you had a polycystronic transcript, that means if you did not have Shine Delgarnos and the ribosome always popped on right here, you would get much more of A than you would get of C. Does that make sense? In protein levels. So sometimes the cell wants this. Sometimes the cell wants more A than C. And so maybe there won't be shine Delgarnos because it wants less C. But if you wanted all these stoichiometries one to one to one, you want to put a shine Delgarno here and here. And then every time a ribosome pops on right here, say if this is ribosome, every time a ribosome pops on right here, Another ribosome pops on here, and another ribosome pops on here, and they read, 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 and translate three proteins all at the same time. One to one to one stoichiometry. Does that make sense? But stoichiometry is not a definition of an operon, okay? You can, you can hack into the stoichiometry. If you make some mutations in that Shine Delgarno, there's going to be less ribosomes popping on here, and so you'll have less B. Maybe you want that. Maybe the cell wants that, okay? So it's not a definition of an operon, but that's what it is. A shine Delgarno is a sequence of DNA or RNA that recruits the ribosome. So I guess it's a sequence of RNA, but before that preliminary in the blueprint, it's a sequence of DNA. Does that make sense? Okay, and I'll just say eukes have similar stuff. Uh, and sometimes in the plasmids that we use, we build things like this. So IRES. IRES, that's an internal ribosomal entry site. So if you make a eukaryotic plasmid and you want to transcribe two genes, you can put gene X, gene Y, and you can put one promoter, and you can encode them in one ORF. So if in theory, let's say you have no stop code on, no stop. Well, you would have a stop codon, but there's no terminator. There's no terminator until the end. Okay? You would want to put an IRES, an interval ribosomal entry site, right in the middle so you can get X and Y. Okay? So that's what an IRES is. T2A is a similar thought. T2A is a peptide from viruses that has the same function. So viruses have polyproteins, oftentimes they have literally just like 
one massive ORF. And this one massive ORF gets transcribed into one massive transcript. Okay. And that transcript gets translated into like 10 proteins. And the way that it does this sometimes is it can put a sequence in here, the yellow sequence, which is a T2A sequence. And the function of the T2A is that when the ribosome, ribosome green, when the ribosome is reading, it will read, it sees the T2A and it skips a peptide bond. Sees the T2A, skips a peptide bond. Sees the T2A, skips a peptide bond. Sees the T2A. And now all of a sudden you have multiple proteins from one transcript. Okay? So the That's for bacteria. And there's a different sequence that's similar called the COSAC in eukes. So they're different. Bacterial, Shindel, Garno, Kozak, Ukes, but the same function. What about IRES and Kinase? You kind of missed it, you said? Yeah. IRES is internal ribosomal entry site, so it's like a Kozak. IRES and T2A, so eukaryotes typically do not have operons. Okay, they tip, this is not something you usually see in Ukes, but sometimes we want to biotechnology, uh, biotechnologically engineer operons if we want something very, very simple system that expresses two proteins. So we can use these to sort of mimic bacterial operons in eukes. So the IRES and the T2A are ways to mimic bacterial operons in eukes. Okay. Now things get really, really complicated. So let's talk about these. So some operons have internal promoters, internal promoters. So biology is not black and white. I told you call regulation, so there's one promoter there, but sometimes there's like a, a little promoter there. Or sometimes there might be a little promoter here going the other way, making antisense, okay? So things are not always so simple. Things get very, very complicated when you start to regulate things. So if sometimes you can even have a promoter going this way and a promoter going this way. And maybe this is on at certain points and this is on at certain points. This would be bi-directional bi -directional promoters. Okay. Um, operon polarity is when the stoichiometry is not one-to-one. -one. So that means you have more A a protein is greater than B protein, or vice versa. I spell it wrong, whatever. You know what I mean. Polarity means it's different. It's not the same. It's, it's in a way, it charges the wrong word, but it's, it's different. Stoichiometry is not one-to-one. -one. Okay, just some stats. 20% of operons have more than one promoter. So oftentimes, if you look at something and snap around, there's probably stuff that you're not seeing that you don't you don't quite realize unless you, somebody has really, really intensely studied that. Um, Six percent of operons have a read through read through terminator. What would that be? What's a read through terminator? So let's let's make an operon. Let's say in here, there's actually a terminator. That means normally, in most cases, the messenger RNA is this. ABC. In a read-through terminator, under certain conditions, condition X, you make the full length. Does that make sense? So is that kind of like co-expression? Co yeah. yeah, it is co-expression. By definition, is it is co-expression. Um, but it's kind of like underneath that, uh, within a hierarchy of regulation. A read-through terminator. It means under certain conditions, you can read through it. The, uh, the RNA polymerase can read through it. So is that like an alteration of the polymerase or... 
That's a really good question. So if I told you one thing, it's probably many things. Uh, it could, in th I'm just thinking off the top of my head, it could be a sigma factor, a special sigma factor, that when complex with the ribosome, or with the, excuse me, with the RNA polymerase, allows the read-through of that particular terminator, or it could be uh, a particular subunit of the RNA polymerase, or it could be a particular sequence, or it could be a particular DNA structure, or it could be an uh, interaction of a DNA structure with a chemical, or, or it could be an epigenetic thing. It could be a bunch of things. Um, but just know that read-through terminators exist. And just because something says terminator does not mean that something automatically stops there every time. It's like in general what it means, but there's always there's always these little hacks that the that the cells can do. Okay, so let's talk about example operons. This is where things get complicated. Hopefully I can do this good. Okay, let's talk about the LAC operon. Let me pull up our picture of it here. Have you guys had the LAC operon yet? No, okay. This is a very, very, very famous genetic circuit. So now we're starting to talk about genetic circuitry, like logic circuits of how to turn things on, how to shut things off, how to encode that in DNA. Okay, so let's look at <clears throat> the LAC operon. This is the LAC operon. The function of the LAC operon is to control metabolism of lactose, which is a sugar and milk, okay? And this is something that the bacteria does not often find. It doesn't find in nature very often. So you want to have deep control of this. And it was one of the first really, really well understood bacterial genetic circuits, okay? So let's look at the genes and the proteins that they encode. So LAC-L is a gene that encodes a protein, LAC-L, which is a transcription factor. So here's a pattern that you're going to see with all these operons is the operon actually starts here. Here's the promoter. But there's often something outside, outside the operon, which encodes a transcription factor. So LAC-L has its own green promoter right here. Okay? Here's the promoter of the LAC operon. And this is the operator. The operator is the sequence where the transcription factor, LAC-L, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. That scared me for a second. Uh, it's the sequence where the transcription factor binds. It's working. I hyperventilated my computer. Uh, okay. So here's how it works. The LAC L will bind to the operator and sit. So LAC L in its natural state is called a repressor. And the reason it represses transcription of the operon is because it physically blocks the RNA polymerase, which tries to bind at the promoter and is blocked by LAC-L sitting on the DNA. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> now what happens if you add a ligand? I can't switch my um, colors here because I'm not that fluent yet. But let's say you add, I'll make a plus sign, which is, which is lactose. <clears throat> the cell encounters lactose. Lactose now binds to the lac L repressor, so LAC L has binding sites for the ligand lactose, and when it binds, it causes it to fall off the DNA. Now the operon is on in the presence of lactose. So you add lactose, turns all these genes on because LAC L falls off. So now LAC Z is on, LAC Y is on, and LAC A is on. LAC Z encodes an enzyme called LAC Z, or beta galactosidase, which degrades and takes the energy from the lactose sugar. LAC Y is a transporter. So it's going to adjust the structure of the surface of the bacteria because it wants to transport in more lactose if lactose is around. Lactose is a nutrient, okay? So if lactose is in the area, let's put some transporters on the surface and let's pull more lactose into the cell, okay? And LAC-A is another enzyme in the metabolism process. But these three enzymes are all you need to get the energy out of lactose, okay? 
Does that make sense? So here's a genetic circuit that's programmed to turn on if the cell only encounters lactose. Okay, is that, that, is that clear? Now, the reason I'm teaching you this is because this is the most common operator that you will use in plasmids. So what they do in plasmids is they've taken the lac operator and the promoter sequence and they've inserted that into a plasmid. And all you need to do is add lactose to turn on your gene X. Does that make sense? So let me go to the notes here and draw this out. So let's say you put the operator. Whoa, what is going on? Okay, you put, oh my God. I guess it's hot. Insert, maybe I can do a new one, operator. Okay, you put the operator and the promoter, that sequence, you insert that in your plasmid. Your plasmid also has to encode the LAC-L repressor with its own gene. Otherwise, whatever you clone right here, X, is going to be perpetually on. You don't want things perpetually on. You want them perpetually off, and you want to turn them on when you want them on. Okay? So if you built a plasmid with the LAC operator here, the LAC repressor, LAC repressor would be perpetually sitting right here, and all you need to do is add lactose to your cells to induce expression of your protein X, okay? Or gene X. Here's the, here's the other trick, though. So there, there needs to be, thinking of how best to introduce this. What's going to happen if you put this into um, a bacterial cell? You put this plasmid into a bacterial cell and you add lactose. What's going to happen? It'll start making the... It will start making gene X. It'll start making gene X. But those cells also have their own, E. coli has its own lac operon. Okay, so in E. coli, that lactose is also going to be turning on the lac, uh, what are they, Y, lac Z, and then the lac A. And those ones are going to start degrading your lactose, and pretty soon your whole gene is going to shut off again, right? Because their the circuitry is programmed so that when lactose disappears, it shuts off your circuit. You don't want that. You don't want that in your engineered circuit because you want your gene to be on when you turn it on. And sometimes you just want to express as much protein as you possibly can. So you don't ever want it to shut off. Okay. So what you do is you add not lactose, but you add IPTG. IPTG is a sugar that mimics lactose, but it can't be degraded, cannot be degraded. So now your cells perpetually have IPTG sitting around. So the genes are always on. And you don't have to worry about IPTG getting degraded and your circuit, circuit shutting off later. Does that make sense? So here's a situation where we use this operator to express recombinant proteins, and we add a special sugar, IPTG, which is a mimic of lactose that cannot be degraded so that our circuitry doesn't shut off. Okay, does that, is that clear? Okay. <clears throat> so the circuitry of this logic is, if ligand Y is present, turn on gene X. Okay, not all circuitry is like that. So let's look at the next one. The arabinose operon. Okay. So here we're seeing a similar pattern. Okay. Here is the promoter for the era operon, which is here. Okay. Now the promoter here is very, very complicated. Here is the regulatory gene. And it has its own promoter going this way. That's what this is. Okay. So here you're seeing the same pattern where the regulatory gene, the transcription factor, arrow C, is outside the actual operon. Okay. So just to guess, what do you think the ERA operon encodes genes for? Remnant breakdown. 
Yeah. Arabinose is a sugar. So it's just like lactose. It's metabolism of arabinose. Arabinose. Okay. So here's how it works. Here, the blue, this little blue triangle thing, that is your air C. Okay. And with, let's see. I see. With minus arabinose, so no arabinose in the cell or around in the area, you form a dimer, two proteins binding together of your air C, and they bind this and this, and they form this loop. And this loop blocks the RNA polymerase from transcribing the structural genes in the arabinose operon. You add arabinose, that changes the structure of that dimer, and it changes the preference of the binding site. So what happens is that dimer shifts and binds a different area. It binds here. Okay? Now all of a sudden, that loop is not there, and your RNA polymerase now transcribes, activates transcription of the Arabad operon, which now allows you to degrade and metabolize your arabinose sugar, okay? We use, switch back to this, we use the arabinose operon in molecular biology as well, okay? So if you build a plasmid, you can insert the ARA promoter, and you also want to insert the ARA C, ARA C, and all that regulatory region is inserted in here as well. And you can put gene X here, plus arabinose. Gene X turns on, minus arabinose. Gene X is off. Okay? Let's see. So this is the same circuit logic as the LAC operon. If ligand Y, arabinose, is present, turn on gene X. That's the same circuit logic. The difference is the physical way of how you're blocking the RNA polymerase is different. In this, it's a loop structure of the DNA that's blocking. Okay? And there are some advantages to this one. Uh, arabinose is, in general, cheaper than IPTG, and it's a tighter off. Okay, so often if a gene is toxic to a cell and you want to clone that gene, you might want to clone it under the arabinose operon because it's a tighter off. The LAC operon can sometimes be what's called leaky, leaky, where maybe you leak a little bit of transcription, which causes a little bit of protein to get, get made, which you might not want because it might kill your cell. This computer is going completely haywire. Block. Okay. Oh my God. I think the file is too big. Next time I gotta make a simpler file. Okay, let's talk about the trip operon. If I can get there. Okay, so here's the trip operon. <clears throat> So the trip operon is, what do you think it encodes? Tryptophan? It encodes the things you need to make tryptophan, which is an amino acid. So it encodes the genes you need to assemble the tryptophan amino acid. Okay? And if you already have a whole bunch of tryptophan, do you need to make more? No. So you need to program a circuit that will shut off when there's tryptophan present, okay? So same thing, same pattern. Here's the operon, and outside the operon is a transcription factor that regulates the operon, okay? So the transcription factor, trip R, makes the trip repressor, and the trip repressor can bind tryptophan, okay? And scroll down here. When it's bound, this, the trip repressor, let's see, will usually shut off the genes. 
Now, the trip repressor and the trip operon is much more complicated. It involves an even more uh, detailed process called attenuation. What's attenuation? It means it's not straight binary. It's not just off on. The, the trip operon is regulated precisely to the amount of transcription you need um, to, the, to basically to the concentration of tryptophan. So it's titrated. So it's it's like um, it's like a it's like, what do they call it analog? Is that what they would call it? It's like you can you can inc slowly increase the levels or you can slowly decrease the levels. It's not just on off. It's not binary. Okay. And the way that this happens is the concentration of <clears throat> this is very detailed. The concentration of tryptophan tryptophan can slow or speed up the ribosome. So imagine you're translating a transcript. And in this genetic circuit, right in here in this region, the attenuator region, there's a whole bunch of codons that code for tryptophan. Right in a row. Tryptophan, 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 tryptophan. Does that make sense? Now, if you are in a low situation of low tryptophan, it's going to slow down the ribosome at that point because you won't have enough tRNAs coupled to tryptophan to keep that ribosome going at full speed. OK, so if you don't have the concentration of tryptophan, it means you need more and it slows down the ribosome and the slows down ribosome then causes there to be an RNA structure that's different. OK, so in the low levels of tryptophan right here. That ribosome gets slowed down, stalls, because it can't find the tryptophan it needs right here to code the protein. And this induces a structural conformation, a stem loop, okay, in the DNA that allows that ribosome to then go forward. Okay, it slows down initially, but then it goes forward and it makes more and more and more of the trip E, D, C, B, A. Okay? If tryptophan is not there, the ribosome does not stall. It's kind of counterintuitive, counterintuitive. The ribosome does not stall. And then there's a different stem loop structure in the, this is the RNA, I apologize, in the RNA that will knock the ribosome off, knocks it off, okay? And this is precisely how the ribosome can be literally sped up or slowed down in a way that causes structural conformations in the RNA that then induces either higher translation or less translation of the trip operon genes, okay? So this is the most complicated one. And I tried to layer these so that initially you see the the um, simple logic circuits, and this would be a very, very detailed logic circuit. And you can find trip operon, <coughs> operon programming in plasmids, okay? So there's all kinds of different levels of complexity in the circuitry that we can use. Okay, so let's just, I, this is good, I finished just right on time. Um, let's talk just a little bit about studying transcription studying transcription. So how do we know all this stuff? Like, how do you study it? Well, initially, everything was done with cDNA. You can make cDNA. How do you make cDNA? Reverse transcriptase can code for cDNA. And you can study cDNA, which is a proxy of messenger RNA. Okay, So you can tell if things are on or off by doing a reverse transcriptase reaction and checking for cDNA. You can, we can study that, okay? So that's how it used to do. And then there came tiling arrays. What's a tiling array? It's literally a little chip that has little probes that bind certain things that you program. And again, it, you can get scanned and you can tell whether certain things are on or off whether the transcript is present based on scanning probes of a region of a microchip 
that are correspond each of the chip regions is programmed to bind a certain messenger RNA molecule. Okay, we don't do this anymore. Right now we do RNA seq. What's RNA seq? RNA seq is high throughput, so you'd use like Illumina. We talked about that sequencing. So high throughput sequencing, it's where you want to sequence all messenger RNA plus small RNAs, all RNA, all RNA in a cell or sample. This is called a transcriptome. Transcriptome. Whenever you see ohm, it means like all of it. Genome is like all the genome of the organism. Transcriptome is all the genes that are turned on of an organism at a particular time. Okay? So RNA seq is basically you first make cDNA and then you do Illumina, which sequences millions of things, millions of different templates at the same time, and it sequences all the genes that have transcribed messenger RNA in the sample to produce a transcriptome. Okay, so that's how we study this. It's how we know things are on or things are off. Uh, and if you want to study things individually, I included the PBAD paper so you can look at how they, so how some of the original people in 1987 discovered some of these regulatory mechanisms in the PBAD operon. Um, and that's where I'll end. Questions? Good. Oh, so on this diagram with the uh...